Aloha, and this is my comprehensive exam presentation. A little about me. I was born and raised in South Texas, Brownsville, Texas to be exact, and moved to North Texas where I attended the University of North Texas and obtained a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology with an emphasis of, on special education. During my last semester of sociology is where I first learned about the study of aging, the gerontology, and it really opened my eyes to everything that the industry has to offer. So I moved to Austin, where I started my career with the Department of Family and Protective Services as a uh, intake specialist, and then transitioned to the Department of Aging and Disability Services which is where I learned about the long-term care administration program at Texas State University. I, of course, enrolled and then transitioned over to the Master of Science in Dementia and Aging uh, cohort. So why MSDA? Gerontology is just so intriguing to me, from the cultural aspects to the theories to the practice of dementia and aging studies, um, but most importantly, to the future. Um, I mentioned that during my undergrad, I took a class on gerontology, and at the time, the estimate was that by year 2020, the elderly population, meaning people aged 65 and above, was going to surpass every other population in the entire world. And I thought, this is it. <laughs> We're at a turning point, and if there is any time to get into the business, it is now. And so here we are. The picture that you see here is of a husband and wife that go around the entire world doing TED Talks about dementia and how to speak to people with dementia. They compare it to improv in which you don't ever try to change the chords. You kind of just go with the flow and uh, same applies for people with dementia. When you're having a conversation with them, what you try to do is just, instead of correcting them, not necessarily agreeing, but always, you know, just saying, okay, and continuing the conversation, which I think is a great lesson for all of us to learn. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that you do watch this video. It's called Improv and Dementia. So I'm not gonna go into all the back details about dementia because of course that is the whole purpose of this course, but I did want to point out an image that just really stood out to me at the very beginning of ever learning about uh, dementia and aging, which is this here. Um, of course, this, is, this highlights a brain on as Alzheimer's, I'm sorry, um, and not necessarily dementia. As we know, Alzheimer's is a subcategory of dementia, not dementia as a whole. But for the purpose of this, this is the picture that drew me in the most to the studies of dementia and aging um, and seeing the, the science behind it and how a disease can, can really affect the brain. A few types of dementia, of course, are Alzheimer's, which is the, the most common, most no, well-known type of dementia. Um, then it's Parkinson's disease, comes in on a close second. Huntington's disease, which is genetic. Uh, there is a myth that, that states that if somebody in your family has dementia, then odds are that you will too, which is not necessarily the case, but with Huntington's disease, I can see how that could definitely be an argument since it is a genetic marker. Um, dementia with Lewy body, which is typically the dementia that we see with uh, that, that have some behavior components to it, um, frontal temporal dementia, and then vascular dementia. So I wanted to show this little infographic just to kind of get an idea of the impact that dementia studies has in the entire world and how we can make a difference as professionals. So two out of three people in the entire world believe that there is little to no understanding of dementia in their country. That's two thirds of the population saying that they themselves or, or people that they know have no understanding of what it is to have dementia. 
and this is where we step in as professionals in, in educating the public so that they do understand uh, how to how to work with people with dementia and also how to live with them as family members. Next little image here uh, shows that 131.5 million people will be living with dementia by year 2050. That's pretty significant, with the majority of them being um, in low to middle income countries. I remember I mentioned that by year 2025, uh, the elderly population will completely dominate the world. And to see that in these numbers is just mind blowing, to say the least. And then I don't know how true this is, but they do say that every three seconds, somebody in the world develops dementia which leads me to my next slide. So there are 7.5 billion people in the world currently, and 50 million of them have dementia. Again, every three seconds. So we think about the impact of that and how that really affects the rest of the world. There's just not enough words to say how significant that is. Um, again, most of that growth is going to happen in developing countries, which are uh, including China, India, South Asia, and the Western Pacific side of the world, which include Australia, Singapore, etc. Now, 58% of those people that do live with dementia live in low to mid-income countries, and there is so much more to say about that. I believe that most of what that has to do with is resources and um, being able to, one, understand what it is to have dementia, and two, understand uh, not necessarily precautionary measures, but things that you can do to slow down the process, not to mention, of course, medical intervention, which some people argue there's no medical intervention to be had. Um, and it is estimated that last year, we spent a trillion dollars worldwide in the studies of dementia and aging, the prevention and the um, just general practice of long-term care, um, which is a huge jump from 2015. We spent $818 billion. So that being said, the theories that have interested me the most through the course of dementia and aging studies are the cognitive plasticity theory, the social cognitive theory, the cumulative inequality theory. And I will be going into those with a little bit more detail in the following slides. So the cognitive plasticity theory is made up by several theories, uh, including the lifespan theory, which is kind of the parent of all the cognitive theories and how they uh, and how dementia plays into that so this theory in specific is multi-directional in the sense that as we age we do lose knowledge that is a known fact but that doesn't mean that we can't gain it on the other end of the spectrum a lot of it has to do with how we interact with people around us and, uh, and, and just in life in general and um, the, the care that we get through that. And the next slide kind of covers person-centered care, which I believe is a huge part in being able to continue learning as we age. So I got this infographic from caring.com that I really like it because it kind of shows you the kind of things that you can do to aid with the progression of dementia or, or to um, slow it down a bit, if you will. So following a routine is definitely something that people with dementia can benefit from so that they're not going out of their normal days because it could break them into a tailspin. Taking a ride can give them a, a small respite, if anything, from uh, the, the general everyday routine that we just finished talking about, but it can encourage them to, you know, sightsee and get new ideas and, and, and just new energy flowing just by simply going out the door.
encouraging artistic expression is definitely something that we want to participate in uh, to, to continue to let them be themselves and continue showing that they are still capable. Um, of course, watching old movies is a common practice that we see in a lot of long-term care facilities. And the purpose of this is to remind them, to, to have them be comfortable in uh, going down memory lane and, and, and thinking about the person that they used to be, that they still can continue to be. And then listening to music, of course, can be very therapeutic in very many different ways. Simply just by listening to something that they did in their youth can bring back a lot of memories or even just uh, help with mood regulation if that ever were to be an issue. Um, planting a bedside garden or an outside garden as well, or even just little pots if outside gardens are not available, but that can also encourage artistic expression and uh, be soothing to some folks. And then of course, writing a letter. All of us want to be heard, and that does not end with old age. That, that in, if anything, increases wanting to be heard and, and not knowing how to have that voice. Um, so help, helping somebody write a letter can definitely be beneficial to their care. So we move on to the social cognitive theory. It first started with Albert Bandura. And I like to think of the social cognitive theory as really a fancy way of saying nature versus nurture, right? So what it comes down to is our decision making, every life decision that we make is influenced by our biases, um, which is something that Kruglanaski and Webster wrote about in 1996 in saying that our ability to process knowledge is based on social cognition. So in simpler terms, everything that we have lived and learned so far in life will determine the way that we will act or react as we continue to age. Um, there are some downsides to that. Um, they say that facts take more effort cognitively than feelings do. Feelings are innate. So a lot of the times we act based on our feelings about something and we don't necessarily look at the facts, um, which is why it's so important to understand where our aging loved ones or residents of we work in long-term care communities, where they come from, because a lot of their background is going to determine the way that they interact in their later life. So one cool thing out of social cognitive theory or based off of social cognitive theory, in my opinion, is uh, el elderly group residential arrangements, which are niche communities that have spurt from um, the idea that it is important to embrace our elderly in situations that they have known their entire lives and are comfortable with. The image that we see here is of this community that started in Florida called Shanti Nikitan. There's one in Houston now, and I believe that there's a third in California. Um, if not, it's being built, but it is the pioneer of these niche communities. It uh, is Indian-based, where they practice Indian practices. They uh, make Indian food and even the caregivers are of Indian descent. And the whole idea, again, is that you embrace the elderly population in circles in which they have lived and are comfortable with. So they continue to be themselves throughout life. Um, another example of a niche community are LGBTQ communities that are uh, being built around the United States for the same purpose to allow our LGBTQ uh, elders to have a safe space where they can be themselves. Um, a particular particular popular one that I can think of right now is in Palm Springs, and there have been many articles and videos made about it. It's really neat. Um, and then, of course, another really interesting one um, is the intergenerational communities. A lot of them are based in college towns or are a part of universities um, that particularly study 
either the elderly or early education and sometimes both and they particularly study the interactions between these two generations and how they can positively affect one another. So the cumulative inequality theory is something that we see on a daily basis and we may not even realize that it's happening, but it's based on privilege and the opportunities that some people may have over others as well as connections and financial freedom and how having a life led in privilege or the opposite not led in privilege can affect the way that we uh, age gracefully. Um, I wanted to kind of give a visual representation of what that can look like. So for example, somebody that comes from affluence or, or has the resources to be able to really take care of themselves financially in old age can, then not everybody will be able to afford those, but that common village of Florida is a skilled nursing community that looks just like a resort that is probably not realistic for the majority of our population. but wanted to contrast that to this other skilled nursing facility that we see at the bottom, South Bay Cairo Nursing Home, which surprisingly um, is actually a five-star rated community on Google. <laughs> so it just goes to show that uh, appearances are not all what they seem to be. But again, just wanted to give a visual representation of what a high-end community versus a lower income community can potentially look like and how that can affect the experiences of our elderly. So current issues with aging and dementia. Um, I like to really hone in and, and try to understand McDonaldization of long-term care because it really depicts a lot of the issues that we have in long-term care communities these days. Um, the, the basic understanding of it is that we try to produce results in convenient ways, and part of those convenient ways is re by reducing a lot of costs. And unfortunately, um, although that does sound like a great business model, it also uh, lessens the care that we provide to our, to our elderly in some situations and and it doesn't allow us to invest in staff and and their abilities um which can come with a slew of other issues um of course costs is part of that mcdonaldization and also part of the uh, inequality theories that i mentioned earlier um and i will get more into this in another slide but uh the cause of long-term care are far surpassing what the elderly are able to afford, which is again not a fair, uh, not a fair playground for people as they age. Um, if you don't have the financial resources to be able to obtain adequate care, then what is there? Um, and then, of course, the taboos of long-term care basically all the scary stuff that people hear in mainstream media and horror stories that people share with one another about terrible things that happen in long-term care facilities, which of course discourage people from getting the care that they need. Um, and even why, when they do seek out care begrudgingly, I think a lot of times these taboos leave a negative impact or a negative um, idea in people's minds and, and, and their expectations are a little higher when, when maybe if they understood what it means to be in long-term care and what dementia and aging means, it could, it could have a different outcome. So can we fix it? I believe that we can. And part of the way that we can accomplish that is through education. Um, of the general public and our staff and co-workers and people that we know in our small circle circles and connections um, as long-term care administrators since this is part of the long-term care administration track of the master of science and dementia and aging um, but as long as as, as uh, long-term care administrators we can also try to help the process by hiring good people and training those good people to be even better 
and investing in them, uh, showing them that we care so that they can in turn show our residents and loved ones with dementia that they care as well. Of course, part of education is providing resources, uh, directing people to right places if we don't directly have an answer so that they can seek the help that they need. And of course, availability. It's not enough to have all these things if we don't make ourselves available to the circumstances. And to finish out, uh, my experiences in long-term care have so far been uh, primarily as an intern while I was um, a discharge planner and admissions director at both Lakeway and Westlake Hills. Uh, trying to finish out my long-term care administration program and, of course, part of the Master of Science in Dementia and Aging. Um, those are the primary roles where I've learned the most about long-term care and the uh, policies and procedures going into the business. Um, however, I think I learned the most about dementia and aging as a sales manager at uh, Brookdale Georgetown Assisted Living, which was the last facility that I worked up at as of two weeks ago, <laughs> but um, the, the, the facility that I worked at was a secured unit, not memory care licensed, but we did attract a lot of memory care residents because of the security and the uh, services that we offered. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that. Uh, and then now I work as a post-acute network representative with a convener program called Remedy Partners, and I think everything that I have learned so far has led me to this point uh, in that I get to be an advocate for our aging population and people with dementia in being in their field as whenever insurance is concerned and uh, trying to prevent them from staying in facilities uh, for longer than they should. Um, and really advocating for best care possible. And all that to say that my future plans in this industry are to be determined. <laughs> they, I, they have changed so much, transitioned so much as I continue to learn um, and engage in the studies of dementia and aging, and I absolutely cannot wait to see more, to see where this world takes us and the different things that come from that. So here are image credits and references. Of course, the uh, caring.com was one of the infographics that I shared. Uh, and everything else that you see here uh, part as part of my project. And I thank you. I didn't mean to rush through the presentation, but the previous one that I recorded was over an hour long. And so I try to get as much of that condensed information into this one slot, into this one show. So I hope you enjoyed. And I do thank all of you for the knowledge that you have bestowed within this program to all of your students, including myself. And I will see you on the flip side.